We are live. Welcome, coaches. How are y'all doing? Thank you so much for being here. I am here with the man that I shot my shot with you, Brian, and I didn't think you were going to respond. And when you did, I was like, let's go ahead and do this. You tell me a time and a place. I'm going to be here. I'm here with Brian Kite. Brian, thank you so much for being here, man. Listen, if if the uh, if the Sultan of Spread, the Minister of Mesh, the the Titan of Tempo says, let's talk ball and building teams. I'm not going to turn that down. So I'm glad to be here, Ron. Uh, dude, you're making me blush. Stop it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for you coaches that are here, if you have any questions, put them in the comments. You know uh, I ask your questions and we will answer them. I'm not going to have you tell us your history unless you want to, because if coaches don't know who you are, first off, they haven't been in the football profession for a long time because you are like the master of culture. And I don't want to bore you. I want to, if it's okay with you, just jump right in talking about building Let's culture. Let's do it. Yes. All right. So let's say that I'm a brand new head coach. Yep. I go to a team that really doesn't have a solid culture. I want to start installing culture. What's like the first thing I should do to get them on board? <clears throat> the first thing is uh, you got to figure out there's two things simultaneously that we have to do. Uh, the first is you got to figure out what do you believe in? What do you stand for? And what would you be willing to get fired for? Literally, what would you be willing to get fired for? Because, and I say that because, and I don't want to forget the second piece because it has to happen simultaneously. But I say like, it's not about what you believe in because everybody, everybody believes in stuff, but not everybody believes in stuff that they'd be willing to lose their job over. That's true. Because job security matters for people. And what happens is the second you get scared to enforce your standards because somebody won't like it, you will slack on your standards and lose your culture. So it has to start with what are you willing to, to get criticized for, fired for, let go of, right? Like, 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 what do you want to do that for? Because as soon as you have that, now you know your commitment is right and you're going to install, right? No matter what happens. Number two is you got to look at who your athletes and who your community is, and you got to build from the things that exist in their culture. You have to start from some things they care about as well. Because what happens, I see a lot of coaches do this, right? Who, who come with beliefs, right? They have you know, there's a lot of depth to this, but we'll start with the simple stuff. The, the coaches start with, they believe in this, 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 right? Yeah. And then they come and they try to impose their belief system onto a group without asking or, or you know, empathizing, being considerate, looking at getting out of their shoes and stepping into the, the shoes of the people they want the buy-in from about what do those people care about? What matters to them? And, you know, between you and me, like, like, if I come here and I try to impose my belief system on you, it doesn't matter if my belief system works. If it doesn't find hook points with you, it's irrelevant. That my, a lot of belief systems work that I don't live. A lot. And if somebody came and tried to impose it on me, I'm not going to adopt it. And like, but it works. I'm like, but I'm not interested. You know what I mean? So with a team, we have to start from who am I? Who am I leading? And how do I take the things I believe in and instill them in the people I'm trying to lead? And this isn't football. This is everything. Instill them in the people I lead based on who they are, right? Based on who they actually are. And I'll give you an example, right? Two, two easy, easy spots to examples, right? Is, you know, you go to some parts of the country that, you know, maybe aren't as well off as other parts of the country, right? And we're leading a high school football team. One of the things that we've got to identify is the young people in those environments, again, generally speaking, right? You might be at a school where the belief system inside that young person and inside the homes that they're living in doesn't naturally believe or feel like they belong among the best. They, okay. they might have a belief system in them that that's reserved for special people, not people like us, not people where we're from. And getting them to believe in high standards and believe they can win championships and believe they can, for some of them, go to college or, you know, make $80,000 a year doing blah, 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 whatever it is, right? Like, you, they won't believe that naturally. They won't believe that because you do. And so part of that is we got to start with, oh, there's some, like, there's some beliefs about the world that exist here that don't exist in this high school over here just because it's regionally different, right? The other side of that is you might go to another school that is in you know, a Beverly Hills more type area. And they believe they've already earned way more than they actually have. And if you come in with this, you know, 
blah, 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 blah. You know, like, like the, the difference between the worldviews is so great that they're going to reject you from the very beginning, even though you're probably going to be spitting truth at them. But you'll lose them before they ever come with you. So that those are the two things simultaneously. And what it always starts with me for coaches is, is internally, it's what are you willing to live and die by? What are you willing to win and lose by? And and I'll I'll go back. Do you remember? <clears throat> kind of a long answer, but it, but I think it's important because because the the it's not the generalities that matter here; it's the specifics. Yeah. Do you remember the quote from it was it was a post conference? I think it was a post game uh, from Gino Ariema. It was a few years ago now where it came out, and he was talking about the importance of body language, and he was talking about he's the UConn women's basketball coach, right? They won all these national championships. And he was talking about body language and how if you have bad, bad body language, I won't play you. Yeah, that was uh, and, he he benched like a star player or something like that talking about it. Yeah, right? and, and, I, and I don't remember if they actually lost that game or not. I think they might have lost that game, but he benched a star player. And, and I, I may have benched her for a couple of games, right? And he's like, I won't play you. He's like, I, I, I don't care. Here. And then he said something super important. He said, I would rather lose than play you with bad body language. Yep, I remember that. Right, and then what happened was this: Ron. <clears throat> all the coaches tweeted that out to players. Yeah, all the coaches hard. tweeted out and goes, "Hey, players, see body language." This, and I'm like, "All of you missed the point. That wasn't for players. That was for coaches. That's why he is an elite champion because he benches a star player for body language, and you talk cliches about toughness. He loses." before he sacrifices his culture. You say that you bet that culture matters, but then you play that guy who is a problem all the time and everybody knows it. And you're too afraid to not play him because he scores most of the points on your team. I love you, but guess what? I'm watching your game film and it sucks. Yeah. Right. Like I'm watching it. We do this with players and this is my job. Like, like you coach hard. I'm a coach hard. Right? Like, let's do it. So I saw that. I'm like, okay, what's the difference? That guy is willing to sacrifice and exchange wins and losses to keep his culture because he knows the second he loses his culture, it's all over anyway. And then these other coaches don't. Yeah. And then everybody's like, well, he can do that because he's got this amazing team. Bring up, what do you say to those coaches that bring that up? Like, hey, this guy can because he has another five star right behind her or yeah. him that they can play. What do you say to that? Because I know you get I that. Say you, yeah, I say you got the cause and effect backwards. He has that because he has the culture. It, he doesn't, that doesn't entitle, in, come on, you've coached long enough. Yeah. Is it harder? What's a, what's an easier team to gain quote unquote buy-in from a, 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 an average, a team full of kind of average talent or a team full of massive talent all over the place and not all of it can play, which is the harder team to hold together? That second one. The second one. Yeah. Don't try to tell me that 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 Nick Saban's job holding all these five stars on in a program is a harder job to hold that together than the coach that doesn't have all of those. Like anybody who's ever coached talent knows in anything, in business and sports, any talent is hard to lead and manage, especially when that talent is stacked in the NFL, in college, in high school. I mean, shoot, in fifth grade. It's like hurting. You cat. Got, my son. So it's like so. My, my point is with with UConn uh, women's basketball, with with the Golden State Warriors. Uh, uh, you know, obviously they're they're kind of trying to come back, right? But like uh, with the Bulls back in the '90s, with with what Clemson is doing, with what Alabama is doing, with what Ohio State is doing. The 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 brilliance is not that their their talent allows them and affords them with the culture. It's that they've created the culture and been so completely committed to it that they're able to get all of that out of their talent. And that's, 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 it's the cause and effect is backwards. I love that because if it, it creates a feedback loop. You have good culture. People are drawn to it. They want culture. So then you just, it's the flywheel. I like to think I read about the Amazon flywheel. It just comes in and it just keeps building and building and building. Well, and it's this, I mean, and again, we get, we go back more specifics. I use this example all the time, Right. But you look at, you know, the three winningest programs in college football over the last decade, Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, okay? All with super strong cultures. Well, would all the guys that love playing for Dabo Swinney also love playing for Nick Saban? I don't know. I, I don't think so. They're super different dudes. Yes, they are. Right? Uh, uh, would everybody who, who 
works, uh, love working with say Urban Meyer or, or Ryan Day, love working with Dabo. I don't know. Like they're just really different guys. And so when you build this strong culture, what happens is anytime, and my daily discipline email tomorrow is about this, right? And I was tweeting it about anytime you set a standard, you're going to anger someone. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter, right? Like if you say we need to be empathetic, right? You're going to, you're going to piss off some people who say that's soft. If you say, you know, we should not be so empathetic, we should be hard with them. You're going to anger a whole, just a whole different set of people. So anytime we set a standard, somebody isn't going to like it somewhere. And so what great coaches do is they choose standards and then they say, I'm committed to the standard. And then what happens is, and you said it, is you attract people who want to be around that standard. It's, o- it's okay if you don't share the standards with me. You go, I believe you ought to work for a place where you do believe in the standards. And if mine aren't them, go, go do them somewhere else. But here we do these standards. And then you attract those people. And then you also very quickly figure out and cycle through the people who have no interest in them. The Patriots are brilliant at this. It's why they can bring anybody in and they never worry ever. Cause like they just, they're like, look, this is what we do. And like the second you want to do this and you're all in, you're here. Now we'll see if you're good enough to actually perform, but like you're in, let's go. But the second you're either not good enough to perform or you are good enough to perform, but you don't want to align with our culture. We have no emotion about the fact that you just don't fit. We just move you on. It's not a problem. Yeah. Like there's no debate talking about it, but you're right. That's their standard and you're going to get haters for that standard, but they really don't care. And it's not like a, you're a bad person. This is the part that I wish coaches would get better at. I really wish coaches would get better. This is a huge part of my mission. I got to figure out how to, how to communicate this better. I wish coaches would stop judging people who don't fit their culture and standard as if they're bad people. Thank you. I love that. If you were beside me, I would slap you on the butt and tell you, I completely agree. I I just like, because somebody doesn't want to live your standard, it does not make them immoral. It does not make them a bad person. It doesn't make them, especially freaking teenagers. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like there's so much judgment that's like, look, I, uh, look, I believe in, you've heard me, right? I believe in no BCD, no blaming, no complaining, no defensiveness. I absolutely believe that that's not a brand that anybody, you know, should want to have. But here's the piece. There's how many good people in your life complain a little bit too much? A lot. There's a bunch and they're good people, oh. right? Like it might be your, you know I mean? You, like it might be your wife. It might be your husband. It might be whoever it is. Like it might be your mom. Like your mom might your mom might not be somebody who takes feedback well. She gets defensive when you say something to her yeah. and she's an awesome mom. Stop yes, judging. Is. It's just like, Oh, it doesn't work, but don't judge it. You know, like we do this. So coaches are just, they're just, and it comes out of the legacy of the profession and I care. And I had that, but I also had coaches who did it the other way. And so, you know, part of this with culture about why I'm more comfortable talking about culture from a performance perspective is if you don't, and I think the Patriots do a good job with this, like, like, and, and it's obviously led by Belichick. There's no judgment if you don't align with the Patriots. They're not mad at you. Right. Like, but a lot of like high school coaches, I'll see them get mad, 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 like personally at a player who doesn't align with the culture. And I'm like, yo, like, that's just a young man learning and developing on his path. Like you're, you don't have to get mad, mad at him. Like let him feel consequences without having to cycle through your emotions. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, that's just, th- those are just some, some pieces like, you know, it makes it very clear. It like, let's, I think it frees coaches up. Frankly, I think like that anxiety and that tension that coaches can hold and they don't talk about it. Cause we got to be like, you know, Macho. I think they got to like, yeah. Like, you know, I, I just think like, I think it's a huge path. They can go down to say, look, we're going to have our standards. And if you want to live these and you don't want to operate this way, you know, like maybe the basketball team works. Like yeah. maybe, 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 maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's golf for you or maybe track. Right. But it's not this football. Maybe it's a different football. It's not this football team. Right. And you could be a killer track star, but here we do this. Yeah. I love and also, you, you never know that once you hold them to that standard and they let them go for one year, they come back the next year, they understand. And I've had this happen on teams. I've been, they become your best player. Like they see the light. Yeah. so to speak, yeah. And then and, and maybe, maybe not. Right. Like, but, but I'm a believer in, in freedom. I agree. Personal choice, right? I want to put people in positions to make choices, right? And so, so, so now, now let me go and I'll let you go to the second piece, right? But so those are the first two is what do you stand for? Like really, really stand for, 
Um, Cause you'll get criticized no matter what. Um, and what are you willing to see? All right, let's see if this wins or let's see if this loses. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, adjust it because of that. And then, uh, I mean, obviously if it's not working, we adjust it. Right. But I'm not going to adjust it because I get some pressure from somewhere, something like that. And then who am I actually working with? Like wh who are they, what culture are they coming from? And how do I, how do I also take into account who they are and build from that? Right. And then we figure out how we link that together. <clears throat> That's number one. Right. Um, the, the, the second piece sort of on the back end of that is <clears throat> as you're trying to install it, right? There's this principle that, and how do I, how do I, I, I uh, bring these together? Here's how I tell teams this. It's a very simple principle. Be you align with us. I like that. Be you align with us. When we tell anybody lose yourself in the team, I get the principle we're trying to communicate, but practically who does that? Like who does that? Like, you know, some people do, but here's the thing. Like, like even if we say some people do, and even if that was the ideal state, most people don't, especially not teenagers. We're talking, you know, a lot of high school coaches, right? Like, especially not high school young men playing football. It's not a habit, right? So if we say, look, no, no, no. Being part of the team actually helps you become more of you better at you and you self-interest, right? You gain as we gain. That's the cool part. And it's also true, right? But who you are has to point in the same direction we're going. The second you point a different direction than us, now we can't, now that doesn't work. But here's the thing. Don't ask your players to be someone they're not on behalf of your team. So how do coaches go about doing that? Like that, that that's an issue that a lot of coaches have that we're trying to change. What what is what is like one tip you can give us to help us work on that? I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you an example, right? Um, I, I I put out on uh, on Twitter. Do you see what I, I put out on Twitter the other day about grit? Did you did you see that? I think I put yes, out yesterday. I did. I tell some about like you know yeah you know, let teachers, coaches, parents telling kids to be gritty, and then and then you know I watch a lot of behavior to it, show it. Not demonstrating a whole lot of grit, right? Yeah. Um, and so, um, and so I've never read the book Grit. I actually thought it was kind of funny. I, I always kind of like laughed around it, like. Uh, I, I didn't need a scientist uh, from, and I'm sure the book is great. Don't get me wrong. Okay. But I didn't need a scientist to tell me that the best measure of a success was the person who worked harder for longer through setbacks. We're going to be more successful than people who didn't, which is what the book says. Okay. And they're like, Oh, it turns out grit's really important. It has been for 4,000 years and we've known it. Like I get it. Right. So I pulled it up for fun and somebody's like, oh, da, da. and I looked and I, and I actually saw some principles. Right. And the first time I've ever seen this and I looked, do you know what the first principle of, right demonstrating gray is what's that interest nice interest and it makes sense right if you're not interested you're not gonna be gritty <laughs> and here's here's why i found that so interesting i've never heard a single professional who is coaching young people around grit sit down and say what are you interested in? Yeah. And then how can I pull grit out of that? What I hear them saying is, this is what I want you to do. Go be gritty. So I'm looking at it and saying, okay. And you know who's the best at this? Nick Saban. It's always the goat. Nick Saban's the best at this because you know what his starting point for recruiting is? You know his starting point for effort is? You know his starting point for getting five stars to sit behind five stars and five stars and five stars for three years, which I believe is his most important skill that he's got. It used to be defense, but now that he's the CEO of Alabama football, his most important skill is he creates a system where five stars will sit for three years before they get playing time, right? Yes. That is and they'll stay in that program. And there's yeah. maybe, I don't know, I mean, there's maybe Maybe four coaches in college football, maybe four that can do that. And he's the best, right? The best. He's the best. One of them. Right, right. How does he do that? Because here's what he does, right? And he doesn't talk about this and his, and his, his persona doesn't show this. He finds out what the self-interest of that athlete is. And then he says, in my system is your best chance to get that. Yeah. I care about what you care about. Tell me what you want. No, 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 no. Not your, not your BS, what you really want. What do you really, really want? What matters to you? What are you interested in? And then he finds what that is, uncovers it, and he says, that's awesome. That's cool. Whether he thinks it is, 
he validates it. Like, okay, cool. There's that. You want like some guys like, look, I just coach, I just want to be rich. Some other coach is going to judge it. He goes, you want to be rich? And he goes, yeah. Because here's what Nick Saban understands. What's the best possible way to get that athlete to do all the stuff that other athletes don't want to do? Is if he believes that what he's being asked to do will give him what he actually wants. Will help him get rich. So I looked it up, this, this piece about grit, right? And the grit was interest. And so I look, it's like, oh, okay. So then we find out what's interest. And then I look, it's like, well, like, you know, find out what somebody's interested in. And then help them pour themselves into that. And then point that interest back to BU. Point the interest in the direction of the interest of our team. But instead, what we get is we get a lot of cliches from coaches who say, you know, it's not about what you want. It's not about, you know, you're not important. And it's like, next, you know, it's like, what's a, like, what's a 16-year-old supposed to do with that? I, I don't know. Like, it's just, they don't come out of the box like that. I mean, shoot, I, I look at some of the messages. I mean, f- f- frankly, I listen at some of the messages and I'm like, dude, like, like, imagine, imagine if, uh, uh, you're, you're in a high school, right? Like imagine if the principal or the superintendent came in and said, listen, sacrifice yourself for the good of the district. Okay. Lose self-interest, be selfless here. Okay. I don't care what you want. This is what the district is doing. Okay. And this is, this is how it's going to work, right? Here's what discipline is teachers, admin. Okay. This is what, this is what discipline is. Okay. Discipline is doing what you were told to do the way you were told to do it, when you were told to do it, okay? Leaders lead, teachers teach, do your job. I'm I'm out. I'm I'm, I'm going. I'm going to do the job. Yep. You're out. But that's what, uh, that's what, (laughs) I mean, I don't know what percentage is, but like that's a very common message to athletes. Yes, it is. Not just in football. And then coach is like, why don't we have buy-in? And I'm like, I don't know. Do you buy into that? I love how you said that because that is one of the questions that just came in from Coach Jay. How do you get kids to buy into your program? Create something worth buying into. Boom. How do you sell a product? Create a product people want. That's the easiest way to sell. Create what people want. What do people want? Okay, well, like, you know. And I say, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be like, I don't want you to, to, to feel coach Jay, like, like I'm saying something like a throwaway comment. Like I genuinely mean that it's this, I don't believe in asking for buy-in. I'm not asking for it. Cause, cause look, if I ask you, will you buy in? There's three answers. Yes. No, maybe. So I'm not asking. I am creating this. I'm going to paint a picture of where it's going. I'm going to paint a picture of what it's going to be like. And I'm going to paint a picture of what it's going to do for you yeah. to the to the best extent that I know, right? And I do this in my own business. I got a guy on my team and I'm like, hired and does all my video stuff. And I said, listen, tell me where you want to go with your career. He's like, oh, I'd like to do this, this, and this. It's not what we do. And I'm like, cool. Would you like to come work with us, do a bunch of really cool shit for a few years, learn how to do it, meet some really cool people, learn about how business works, and build a big brand because I think I might be able to help with that and do a lot of really cool stuff. And sometimes we can do some of these things that lead in this direction. And then in a couple of years, you can make a decision about whether or not you want to like stay doing this or like you fall, maybe fall in love with it. Maybe you don't, or like maybe it falls in positions. You're like, would that be cool? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, I great. I would love to have you on the team. That is awesome. Cause you've like aligned just, what he wants and correct. that is, that is brilliant. And he, and he could have said, right. He could have said, no, that's not, that's not really in alignment with what I would like. I don't feel like that's my path. And I'm like, okay, well, I might listen and hear. I for sure would listen here. And then I might be like, okay, well, maybe I think there's something he doesn't see about that. And I might say, well, I think it could be a cool path because it looks like this, right? Like try to like show him if there's something I see. Or I would listen and say, you know what? I, you know, I think you're right. I, I, I think I think the path that you want to go down isn't really served by this. And this isn't the best place or or maybe it would be, but you don't want to do work like we do work, right? Like you don't want to, and then I, and then I see, all right, like good guy, but either not the right path or doesn't want to work like we work. And I send it a different direction. So creating buy-in, right? Happens not because we ask for it, not because we demand it. It happens when what we create, the other person's interested in it. That's what buy-in is. Like how did Tesla create buy-in? Right. Like they made an awesome product and then they made it better and then they made it more awesome. And then they right. And they looked and it's like, look, if you don't like electric cars, if you don't like futuristic looking things, you're not buying a Tesla. 
because you don't buy in and that's your choice, not Tesla's. They're not asking you to. They're making products for people who like that stuff. They're making products for people who want to update their car with software every six months. That So not everybody's going to buy in. So that's number one. Number two is this. Don't be afraid of people telling you that they don't want to be part of your program. How do you how do you do that? Because that, that I, I've talked to a lot of coaches, as I'm sure you have too. That kind of hurts a little bit. Like when I'm going after a kid that I think will be a good fit, and they're just like, "No, nah, I don't want that." Not your call. <laughs> <laughs> so simple, yet so correct. That's that's on them. It's not your life. It's not their call. Move on. But like, how do you how do you teach know, like, coaches that? You ever ask you ever ask somebody on a date in a past life, and they told you no. You ever yes, ask somebody to prom and they're like, no, thanks. Yes, I have. I, I know it hurts, but what, what are you going to do? Make them go to prom with you? Move on. Ask somebody else. Like, like it's the same kind of thing. Like, like again, I, I try to connect it. Like, like I want the standards to apply to the people who are setting them. Right. So it's like, if a coach is saying, well, but it hurts when I want this kid to come in and he doesn't buy into me. I'm like, okay, well that kid is trying to make friends every day. And is your heart breaking over the fact that that kid is making fun of somebody else or that they are asking him a prom? Like, do you empathize with their situation? on the same basic dynamic as the one you're struggling with. And I'm like, nah, not always. So I'm like, okay, well, like, I know it hurts and I know we want X, Y, Z, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, I fire off a tweet or I write an email and I think it's fire and I think everybody needs to hear it. And then it just bombs and it's crickets. Yeah. It, it didn't work, you know, like move on. So it's a, what I mean is this, it's okay if people don't buy in, because, you know, here's how I think of it in my life. I think of it like this. This, this helps me framing wise. <clears throat> um, the majority of people have no idea who I am. The majority of people, right, have never heard of X, Y, or Z about even, frankly, even what I would do. So, like, it doesn't matter if somebody doesn't like me because they already didn't know who I was. Second piece is this. I've been, I'm 38 years old, right? Whenever I do a keynote or I do something like a, a video like this, like, you know, there's some coaches like, you know, couldn't stand that guy. Here's how I think, right? I made it 38 years without that person's approval. Yeah. I got a wife. I got beautiful kids. I, I make a lot of impact in the world. I'm, I'm, I make mistakes all the time, right? Like no problem, right? But like if one person's like, I don't buy into that or I don't like that or I don't think they were very good, like that just doesn't shatter me. It doesn't, it frankly, it doesn't even like occupy space in my mind because I'm like, well, yesterday I wasn't worried about what Bill was going to think of me. So tomorrow, if Bill tells me he doesn't want to be part of my program or whatever, like I'm okay. And I think the same thing with athletes. Like, like we can't let, and this, this is a hard part about the profession. We can't let our heart like get so big about trying to get somebody that it causes us to become ineffective, right? Or not live by the principles that we establish. And we want corners to get over, you know, getting beat, yeah. right? Next play, next play, next play. Okay. Well, coach, next play, next, play. you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. next play, right? Just quit jabbing at the ref. He ain't changing his call, Thank right? You. Now you look soft. Now you're losing control. Now you're next play coach, right? Like, and this is my job, right? Like, like I love working with athletes, but the, the majority of my job is coaching the coaches and and, I, and I'll tell you right now, like I, I got my start in this. You, you said, you know, we weren't going to, we don't, I don't go my whole history, but I got my start in this, you know, 20 years ago when I was playing college football. And I recognized, I recognized that the most undercoached profession in America was coaches. Mm -hmm. And coaches get a ton of coaching on the scheme side, a ton of coaching on practice structure, right? Not a ton of coaching on, the actual controls that make everything go none right we, we do we do light stuff right and i love being on these 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 sessions right because we get to get started on but i i wouldn't even call this coaching per se right like this is information yeah a book is information um and you know we're awash in information and it's 99 noise right like i'm talking about true coaching game film observation critique strengths and weaknesses the, the same way you coach an athlete, how do you get that same version for you? Because athletes aren't going to get better if you don't coach them. And I look at the same thing. Like if, if an athlete coached himself, very limited. Yes. If a coach coaches himself, very limited. So that's what, we do. that's what I got in this 20 years ago.
I, I love that. And I'm glad you brought up the refs. That, that really, I will toot my own horn. I don't get mad at refs because I have yet to see someone scream at a ref and the ref goes, hey, coach, you know what? You're absolutely right. Let me go ahead and pick that up. Uh, let me let me call it back or anything like that. I've seen it actually get worse because now that ref's like, oh, F you, buddy. You, you, you're dogging me. I'm going to make your life a living hell. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a there's a I mean, there's a lot of different pieces, and and it's not pretending like you don't have emotions. It's not like refs don't make bad calls, right? It's just it's just management of attention and energy. Like, is that attention and energy? Because it's it, attention and energy are finite, right? Like they're not limitless. And in a game, you know, time is a constraint. And so, you know, the question is always: Should attention and energy go into getting mad at the ref? Or should attention and energy go into observation of the field, connecting with my players, looking at the flow of the game, you know, looking at what our next script series is going to be, you know, it's just, for me, it's just this way or that way. Uh, and I equate it to like, you know, I equate it to, yeah, a delayed or canceled flight is frustrating. Of course it is. But, and, but it, it happens every time you fly as much as I do, especially like something's going to happen. So I look and I'm like, okay, well, all the people who are really mad at the, at the gate agent, are they getting better flight outcomes as a result of their anger at the gate agent? Nope. But me, but me being kind, nice, considerate, right? Both to the people on the phone as well as up there. Like I get to line. First thing I say is, hey, I'm like, I really appreciate you being here. This is a tough situation. There's a lot of unhappy people here and I think you're doing a great job. I just want to let you know. And she's like, do you want a first class seat on this flight? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, let's go. And what happens is, again, and I'm not doing it to get a first class seat, but I just know is this, my anger, my anger is not going to change anybody's mind. But my anger could. And also, I, I, I mean, I think if we look at it, right, what are we displaying for the athletes? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll let you guys come up with the coaches that you see, right? But like there's coaches out there that preach discipline, right? There's that preach composure, man. And I watch them on the sideline. They're flipping out. Yeah. Like, like they look like an animal. Do as I'm I like, say. What? Do. I'm like, bro, what is wrong with you? Yeah. You're going to have an aneurysm out on that sideline right there. And it's just immediate. Like, you can just see it just permeates the culture. It's like, oh, okay. We're about this. We're about lip service. And it's like, it just, because culture is so fragile, right? It's so fragile. Whatever culture you built last year, it's irrelevant this year. Irrelevant. I love that. It's on the hook. Every single year, especially in high school and college, because there's so much uh, uh, transition and, and turnover uh, among the athletes, it just it's so fragile. So we got we got to do everything in our power to protect it, and it all stems from us as leaders. I, I love that. And coaches, I hope you're right now. I'm, I've already written a whole page front and back, and I'm gonna listen to this again. And we've got a lot of coaches here. Andy, what's going on? You're here, Brent. That's by the way, that right there. There's my two guys. Right, Andy is. Uh, Andy is our, our video guy who I was talking about, who uh, he was, he made awesome videos. He worked for Clemson football and our conversation revolved around when he, when I was hiring him onto the team of, Hey, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? That's what I was talking about. And, you know, we were working through like what's in his best interest. Um, I'm like, look, I think there's a lot of contribution you can make, but it's not about what I think you can do for our team. It's about what do you want to do? And are you interested in this? And cause I'm not going to change where we're going as our team. I'm not going to change that. The question is like, do you want to be part of this and contribute to it? And if you do, I'd love to find a role and help you here, but it has to also work for you because I want all of your energy, right? Like I want everything you're best at coming through us and like, you know, we're just working through that. So it's, yeah, I love having my guys here. Heck yeah. And then we got Evan here. He's like, wow, what are you willing to lose over is a powerful question. Fantastic stuff, coach. Love that, Evan. Love it. Uh, we got a coach. We got a question from uh, Joshua. Any advice for a younger coach being put in a leadership position with an older staff? Uh, yeah, number one, everybody. I was this guy, um, and I started doing this when I was 22, so I was younger than everybody, right? Um, number one is a pre give yourself a little bit of a break. Everybody has self doubt. Uh, everybody struggles with what's called imposter syndrome. If you've never, if you've never heard of imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome is uh, when you're in the room and you're quietly, secretly inside your head telling yourself, uh, if they actually found out they let me in here, they would kick me out because I am the only person in here who does not belong, right? That's imposter syndrome. Everybody has it, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, or at least has been through it, right? Like we can learn how to get over it. You know, the second piece is the second piece is this. If, if, if you're in a leadership position, and if Josh, if you can write a note what your leadership position is, I'd like to speak to your position because if you're the head coach, coordinator, position coach, those are three different answers. Um, 
but I can talk through a, a couple of them. So if you if you uh, if you're able to let me know where you are, uh, I'm happy to to speak to your situation. Um, but in a position of leadership as a younger person, we have to understand uh, a couple pieces about leadership. Number one, understand the basics of leadership is this: uh, in leadership, we are responsible for things that we do not control. Uh, the difference between being a performer and being a leader, and this is really good for all of you to pass on to your athletes as well, because the principle of leadership is the same, is that a performer is responsible for himself, right? Like a player, like a player is responsible for himself. Uh, a leader is responsible for more than himself. And I'm talking himself, you know, I'm, there might be some women, so I'll try to do both. But I'm just, I'm, you know, with a football, mostly men world, so I'm saying himself. But a leader is responsible for more than himself. So the difference between being a performer and a leader is that is that we are responsible for more than us, and I only control me, but I'm responsible for more than me. And that line is very, very clear. And that's why I'm not a fan of telling everybody they have to be a leader because not everybody wants to or is ready to take responsibility for more than themselves. A bunch of you have players on your team, and all they need to be is a player. Don't ask them to take responsibility for more than themselves. They're not ready or they don't want to. Make sure they're trained and skilled and developed and you help them take responsibility for themselves because you can go compete and win championships with a bunch of dudes who take personal responsibility. You only need a handful of true leaders to really go out and win. That's on the player side. On the coach side, Josh, it's, <clears throat> it's knowing where you are from a role perspective, right? The leader's job is to make decisions and solve problems. That's your job. Your job is make decisions and solve problems. Why? To put producers, performers in position to do what they do well, right? So if you are a position coach, you got to understand whose job is it to make the decision and solve the problem, right? Basic rule, right? If you are here, right, your job is to solve the problems that if you're a position coach, right? Solve every problem that you can solve. But the second the problems rise above your level of decision making, what you've got to understand is you are now the contributor, not the decision maker. The head coach's job is to create the culture that he wants to create. Your job is to make that culture work. It doesn't matter if you disagree with the culture. It doesn't matter if you would do it a different way. You're not the head coach. I see this all the time. Like, like what should I do? I'm like, I'm, are you on the staff? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, are you a position coach? They're like, yeah. I'm like, then make the culture work. I'm like, I don't agree with it. I'm like, then quit. I'm like, well, it's not that bad. Okay, then stop. Like, that's the head coach's job. Like, what are we doing here, right? Like, so like, like if you're a position coach, make decisions and solve problems at your spot. And then here's the thing. This is, this is, this is the simple thing for a young coach, right? Number one, do not, do not feed because it's going to be there. Do not feed the self-doubt and insecurity of everybody's looking at me and feeling like you have to overperform. Okay. You don't. Okay, you might get some shit from people who are like, oh, the young guy, the this, the baby, blah, blah, blah. That's very normal. I got it. That's just what people do, right? Every now and then it still happens. I, I got enough gray that like, I don't know. I, I People don't say that to me much anymore. But like, you know, I'll, I'll go into like an executive room. Like, oh, how old are you? I'm like, I'm 30. I'm 38 now. They're like, oh, I'm 30. I'm like, oh, you're just a baby. And no, it's not. That's not what I want to hear when I walk into an executive room when I'm leading the session. But at the end of the day, like, okay, whatever. But here's, here's the piece. I know what I'm doing. I'm really good at it. I'm prepared. And I will absolutely immediately and readily acknowledge when I don't know something and I'm out of my depth. Okay. Um, you're right there. Cause that's, that's huge. How do you teach that? Cause a lot of coaches don't want to do that. That's your, then, then you need to work through your own ego. Like, here's the thing, right? Like, again, go back to, to, to some really core things, right? People say stuff like, no, I'm not saying I'm perfect. Who accused you of that? Like what you act like you're admitting something <laughs> who, who said you're perfect and you're out here like admitting like, dude, nobody said that. Right. Yeah. So the point is like people ask me, I had somebody, I was at the AFCA conference or no, where was it? Oh, it was the uh, USA football conference. We were at the bars a couple years ago. We we're at the bar after hanging out, talking to some coaches and, and the coach is like, dude, he's like, he's like, how do you like, he's like, how do you like, how do you like stay humble? Like, you know, you got all this and whatever. And I'm like, it's a silly question for me, whatever. But like, I'm like, okay, like how do you stay humble? I'm like, okay, well, here's, here's why. Here's how I stay humble. I look at all the things that I can't do. I look at all the people who have no idea who I am, that if I were to like email them or call them or see them in the street, they go, dude, who are you? 
Yeah. I look at all the money I haven't made. I look at all the stages I've never been on. I look at all the games I've never won. And I immediately recognize, yeah, I have, I've, I have absolutely no excuse to not stay humble. None. And this was, this was, Ron, for me, this was the origin of why I committed my whole life to this craft, why it was a calling for me. This was the origin for me, okay? It wasn't that coaches were undercoached. I do believe they are, but that's, that's I'm frankly, that's not that hard to solve. I could just get good coaching. Here's where it started for me. I was so frustrated as an athlete at career 500 coaches who had big egos, were jerks, and they didn't listen to anybody. I was so frustrated. They hadn't performed at a championship level. They were hovering around career 500 or somewhere in that range, right? And then they just had giant egos, super low humility, and they were command and control freaks. And my 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 logic as an athlete, and I go back and like, you know, I I, I handled, I'm sure, things like an 18, 19, 20-year-old. Like I'm I'm, I'm my 38-year-old brain looks back with a lot more wisdom than my 19-year-old brain did, trust me. But I looked at that, and I'm like, okay, like let's follow this, right? Like I follow you, I do everything you ask, where's that go? I got, I got, I got 14 years of career track record to see. Where's that go? It goes to about 500. I'm like, yeah, I'm not interested in average. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. And as a player, right, as a player, we're limited in coaches don't want to hear that from players. There's, there's, you know, it's tough. Right. And then as you know, and especially when we're young, we don't communicate well. So probably our ego comes out. Right. But like, my point is if we're, if you're 25, right, you need to start figuring out that ego thing. It's time, right? If you're 40, you're behind the curve. You need to devote the next 12 to 18 months of your life to figuring that out. And do not do not go take the mesh course until you figure your ego out. Okay. <laughs> or at least do them concurrently for the love of God. Okay. I don't want to I don't want to hurt the I don't want to hurt the the learning, right? But it's this. It's like, what's mesh gonna do for you? Right. You if you force things down people's throat and you don't listen to feedback, what's mesh gonna do? Nothing. It's gonna be worse because it's, it's gonna complexify your program. Yeah. And so, I'm all that, that that thing, that's what I love about you. You pr also preach simplicity, which, oh, which resonates with me like right here, man. That's that's one of the things. I hope I, hope I don't preach it too much as like I teach people some specifics. Like I hope I hope I I hope you know I hope I I I don't I don't sound I preachy. Didn't, I didn't, I didn't, no, there, no, I like you know? The way you you talk, it just it it makes sense. There's something in the in my brain that just like this is it, and it it checks. Yeah, I, I love that about you. So so to 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 finish Josh's question, Josh, what level you are, you understand wherever you are from a coaching perspective. Understand a couple pieces. Number one, solve every problem that you can solve and make all the decisions that you can make at your level and have your stuff buttoned down. Do not be insecure about what you don't know. And I understand you're going to be insecure and you're going to have self-doubt. So when I say don't be, it doesn't mean that when it exists, it's wrong. I mean this, do what you need to do through your insecurity and through your self-doubt. Somebody asked me, how do I get rid of self-doubt? I said, you don't. You do all the things you need to do through self-doubt. That's just how it works, okay? Because the second you beat that self-doubt, you will elevate and new self-doubt will show up. That's how it works. So, so handle everything you can at your level and recognize if there's somebody above you, their job is to make the decisions at their level and your job is to make those things work, period. That's how it works. Like that is, that's the nature of it, right? The best way to work for a frustrating boss above you is to make that boss believe that the best chance of them, them being successful is through you. Become their best friend. Be their best ally. Be the person who gets the most so that they trust you and they're confident in you and they like you. Therefore, they will listen to you. Okay. That's that. Second piece is if you're the, if you're a coach who's leading older coaches, right? Recognize that you don't control them and that there may sometimes, right? Don't project this onto them, but there may sometimes be some coaches who are a little longer in the tooth, a little gray in their hair, who look at a younger coach and they think that blah, 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 blah. You recognize this is part of the culture and the confidence that you build is same principle, find out their self-interest, point in the direction of yours. And then you got to say, Hey, my job is to make these decisions and your job is to execute them. This only works if I make the decisions and we execute them. If you find you're incapable of executing the decisions that I need to make because you disagree with them, maybe there's a different staff that you need to be on. I'm here and I'm for it. I will listen, but my job is to make the decision. Okay. If it's a decision I believe you can make, I will defer it down to you. 
Okay, I will, and I don't want to no, down. Like I'll defer it to you. I'll, things I don't need to make, you can have it, right? But if it's my job to make the decision, I'm going to make the decision. I will listen. I'll bring input. And once I bring it all in, this is the nature of how teams work, okay? I'm going to take all the input in. I'm going to listen to everybody. And then I'm going to make the call. Then you're going to go execute. But if I have to make the call, I'm going to make the call. And the expectation is you execute the call that I make. Are we good? Awesome. Now, if you have a very weak relationship and you haven't connected with that coach, you're going to have some fracturing. So you got to connect with those guys so that when you're doing the harder stuff, and I think this is why we build trust and confidence in each other, trust ultimately only really matters uh, uh, like the, to the extent that we talk about it, 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 it really is only there for supporting the hardest things that we have to do, right? In a marriage, you know, uh, uh, day to day, you know, trust isn't like the make or break of our marriage, right? But like when a financial issue shows up or we got to move across the country or something like that, trust is there to support the hard stuff. And if we didn't build it beforehand, when the hard thing shows up, that gap in trust is simply like all the stuff's going to fall down there. So building the trust beforehand, the confidence in one another beforehand matters when before the hard stuff gets there. That's how we build that strong support. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And dude, your your analogies are on point. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that. I I, I freaking love them, man. Uh, that's a great question. We got another question uh, about it. Coach Lowry, great interview. How do you get administrators to buy into changing the culture of a program, specifically the AD, the head school administrator, or the head of the booster? It's not going to be a different answer from the other one, self-interest. Um, look, at the end of the day, I mean, this is the, this is the, this is the principle of anything. It's what's in the self-interest. So, <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, not an analogy, but, but, um, uh, uh, truth. The president of Alabama, uh, University of Alabama, a few years ago said, uh, Nick Saban is the single best investment in the history of the University of Alabama. Think about that for a second. That's huge. Nick Saban gets paid about $8 million a year. The booster club pays his entire mortgage and all of the insurance on his house. Follow me here. He gets paid $8 million a year. He has a giant house and the club pays for it. And then he has a private jet to fly around. Like, like the total comp for him is massive, right? President said, best investment in the history of our university. Why? Because if Alabama football wins a lot, fills the stadium, goes to national championships, is on TV everywhere, what happens to the University of Alabama? Everybody wants to go there. And when everyone wants to go to Alabama, what happens to their endowment and their fund? It grows. It grows. Does Nick Saban give two nickels about the endowment at Alabama? No. Doesn't think about it twice. But what he understands is this. Your self-interest and my self-interest are on the same page. You want money in your spot. The best way to get it is through the football program. Help me become a winner, and I will help you swim in money in your university. Once he gets them hooked on that, boom. The difference is Nick Saban actually looks and asks himself, figures it out, and then figures out how to make sure that they see that they get what they want through him. He does it with 18-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 12-year-olds, maybe 10-year-olds pretty soon. Right? Right? And then he does it with the 15, 6-year-olds running university. So same thing with the administration is find out what the administration wants. Stop pushing your agenda. And I don't mean to suggest you are doing this. I'm just sort of speaking, I don't know, with some authority, I guess. Stop pushing your agenda of what you want them to do and start figuring out what they want. Then figure out how to make that happen through your football program. And not the, the, you, honest to God, that is the secret sauce right there that no one has ever talked about that coaches, seriously, y'all need to be writing this down. You align because when you align, everybody's going, ah, I'm speechless right now. I know that's that's incredible to think. Here's, here's, let me tell you what I think the harder part of this is, by the way. <clears throat> I actually think that's the easy part. I think the hard part is this. You got to do that without absorbing the culture of your school. What do you mean by that? Because you can't absorb the culture of your school into your football program. You'll lose. What if it's a good culture at the school? It's not the same, though. 
It's not the same culture. You can't absorb. It's like, you know, you go to any school, you can't absorb the culture of the school because the culture of the school is not the same as what needs to exist inside of a football program. Like there's just things we've got to do in a football program that is not, are not going to be supported by the majority of the school. I mean, you look at how we have to operate in the weight room alone. Like how many kids who do what they need to do in the weight room, leave the football program and the, the messages, culture, and tone of what you ask for them from them in the weight room are supported and echoed by the staff in the larger school. None. Well, probably not a ton. And if you have that, I would love to visit your school <laughs> because I just would like to see that. Like that'd be awesome. I don't want to come get a lift in, but, but, but it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. There's elements, right? But you can't absorb that. And it's even more on college campuses these days. Cause that's where it starts to get dangerous is on college campuses. There's no way a college football of any college sport can absorb the culture on a college campus today. You can't absorb the culture from the classrooms. You can't absorb the culture from the athletes. I mean, and here's the thing. Let's go forward. Let's make it even more difficult. You can't absorb the culture from TikTok and Instagram. Yeah. And you for sure can't absorb, this is where it's hard, you can't even absorb the culture from the living rooms of the homes that your kids live in because they're too disparate. And those people are too close to their kids. And the, the parents are not part of your culture. They are a layer up from your culture. Your culture are the people who work or are team, mem team members inside the program. The boosters are a layer just outside of that. They're not in the locker room. They don't lift with you. They don't practice with you. They don't have the same consequences for success and failure as you do. And therefore, they are not responsible for the culture the way that we are. So the hard, the aligning people, that's one thing from a mission perspective. And I think that's the easier one. But, but building the culture you need to build and the way I, I like, think of it like, um, think of it like uh, uh, Russian dolls or like, you know, think of like a, a square with another square above it and another square above it, another square above it. You've got your culture here in each guy, right? The, the makeup of each guy in the program. And then that makes up the unit, right? Offense, defense, but specifically quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, O-line, right? You got all these units in each culture. I was a DB, right? DBs and wide receivers, different cultures. Yes. Right. All, all you O-linemen out there, you guys are weirdos. You got your own very special culture in O-line. Okay. Very different cultures, right? So you have individual culture, if you will, that comes out of me. Each person is different. And then you have your units. They're different. And then you got your team, which is the roll up of the collection of all these small cultures that come together for what our team is. Okay. Really, there's no such thing as a total team culture. There's simply the, the alignment that exists across the smaller cultures of our team, just for whatever that's worth. And then the, the one culture that most, most people ignore, and I'll just, I would like to give this to everybody, the one culture that most football staffs ignore is the staff culture as its own individual identity, living and breathing. Um, that's a whole bit. Then there's the team, okay? Now here's the hard part. The hard part is this. You need that culture to stay exactly what you need it to be, but the amount of influence from the cultures around you and above you are massive weights. And what we've got to figure out is how do we create the culture that we need in here, right? Without absorbing the culture of the outside, but also not conflicting and violating what's out there. How do you do that? You make your belief strong, number one. And then number two is stop judging the external cultures. Stop judging Instagram and TikTok. Stop judging social media. Stop judging campus culture. And then also explicitly state our culture is ours. It's not that it's not this. It's not, you know, tell parents, listen, we want your contribution. We want you to contribute, but there's a line between the culture we have inside of, of our guys and with our bond and where we are and where you are. And while you contribute to a lot of really awesome things about our program, the true, true, true culture is for the people who are inside the team. And as a parent, that's just not where you sit. We want you to help that and contribute to a bunch of cool things. But one of the best things you can do to contribute to our culture is let our guys participate in our culture themselves. Let our guys and us build our culture ourselves with our teammates. You're not our teammate. How do you? You're, okay. So that's that's our supporter. It's tough, man. Yes. It's tough, you know, but this is the thing. I think the first thing I do is you got to look inside yourself, right? Like 
people respect honesty. Yeah. You know, I, I talked with, with uh, uh, Keith Grabowski a few years ago. Uh, we, were, we were going through our, our on the, the, the I forget what we called. We called it the, uh, uh, we had a series that we did on the coaching coordinator podcast. Uh, um, and, and this is, I don't know, three years ago, whatever, but, but, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's building gates into your program, not walls. I like that. And, and too many, too many coaches that I've seen are building walls. Right. And then from inside their walls where they blocked everybody, they'll lob grenades outside of criticism at parents and administration and whoever. And then, you know, you build up a big wall, nobody's in there. And then you're lobbing grenades over. What are people going to do back? Lob them back. They're going to start chucking the grenades in or they're going to start trying to infiltrate. And all. So it's like, you know, we've got to tear down these walls, right? And then just like establish clearance. So I think look, look in your heart. Like if you're defensive, if you walk up and you believe, and I've seen this happen a lot, there's, there's a lot of people who don't do this, right? But sometimes it's easier to see the dysfunction. You know, if you walk in believing, you know, a, having a little bit of an antagonistic perspective towards parents, it's on you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like people sense that. That's a, that's a vibe. That's an attitude. And like, you know, if I'm a parent and I walk in and I'm me, right? I got a son. If I walk in in the first meeting, this coach is like, now listen, I don't want to hear from you parents. I don't want to blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what's this guy doing? <laughs> like, I, I, you're going to listen to me. You know, like, dang, like. You know, I want to be invited. And here's the thing. I always tell people, show parents what their specialized role is. Give them meaning. Give them something they can do that they can sink into. Like they, these are their kids. They want to. And in the absence of being shown a good path on how to make a meaningful contribution, they will invent their own. And when parents invent their own, they're not known to make great decisions. Yeah. So give them, show them the path. Give them the avenues of, hey, here's how you contribute. This is what we need. This is where you make it. And, and then celebrate it. Like, Make it incredible. Make it amazing, right? And and then that, then they're pleased and they're happy and they got good relationships. Then, when you don't start their kid, they love you, and they're like, "Oh man, okay." But they feel really good about everything. Not all the time, but you got a much better shot that way. You're you're preemptive striking yeah. any any kind of problems coming up from parents when you do it that way. Correct. Correct. I freaking love it. And you said something that I. No BCD. You're big on that. I love that. I, I watch everything you talk about. I feel as if I'm good on the blaming. A lot of coaches on the blaming and the complaining. Complaining yep. not so much. Defending. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips on how not to defend? Because that's like natural for me. You, someone comes yeah. at you, the first thing you want to do is you want to defend yourself. How do you flip that and and start not? So let me let me let me let me answer this by asking some questions. Okay. Why do you feel like you need to defend yourself? It's an ego thing. 100%. Like you're coming at me, you're attacking me. My my defenses come up on everything. You sure. know, I have to prove why I'm doing that. And how often do you do that? I don't mean how often do you get defensive. I mean how often do you prove to the other person and eliminate their criticism to the point of both their and your satisfaction? Not that much. So the first thing I would tell you is that's not a great strategy then. <laughs> yeah. I know you, I know you feel that way. I mean, it's like, it's like people who would like tweet at the president because they're <laughs> mad at him. I'm like, <laughs> or just random. I'm like, what you, I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. And they're like, well, it's stupid. And I'm like, and I, by the way, I don't care what president either. Right. I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, well, it's stupid. I'm like, did he respond? Did he like, did he ask for your input? Like, are you, are you like in depth on, on, you know, this, like, is this a topic that you ought to be hired for in the cabinet? Like, what are we doing here? So go back of, of the first is, okay, what are we doing? How often does it work? Okay. Second piece, let's go back a step then. Second piece is, let's say, let's say that you were, you had a higher hit rate. My mm -hmm. question would be, what are you, what are you in fact accomplishing even with a higher hit rate? Like what, what are we accomplishing? Did the outcome that they say happened not happen? Did... Did you not like the way they received what you said or what you did? Uh, like, what what are we trying to actually change here? What what what's the real end goal? Because here's how I look at it. Here's how I look at this, and why for me defensiveness is a non-issue. <clears throat> let's put it in let's put it in the context of E plus R equals O. Okay, for those of you who don't know, event plus response equals outcome. Right? 
We don't control events. We don't control outcomes as much as we want to. Because uh, if you controlled outcomes, what would your record have been last year, Coach? I would be undefeated state champ. Were, were you undefeated state champ? Not a, not at all. And why weren't you? Because you don't we control outcomes. Exactly. <laughs> if you controlled outcomes, you would do all the stuff that works, right? Like, yes. So my point is like, like it was like, I do. I'm like, well, if you do, then like, dude, start solving stuff because we have a lot of problems. So start solving and, you know, go be, you don't. And so like, well, they, and everybody's like, well, I would if they went, I'm like, well, well, then that's an outcome you should create. Make that person do what you want. Like, so we really quickly learn we don't control outcomes. What we control is our response. Okay. So, so let's look at this. Something happened. We pursued something and there was a context. We said or did something in a certain way. And then an objective outcome was created, okay? An outcome universally, everybody can look at and say, yeah, that happened. And then a bunch of subjective outcomes happen, which is what everybody feels about what happened, right? The impact it has on them. So for me, it would be, right now the context is I'm on this with you. Mm -hmm. My response is the stuff I'm saying, the way I'm saying it, okay? And what I look like, I suppose, right? And then the outcome is, right, like, exactly what I said. Okay. That's the outcome. The subjective outcomes is what everybody thinks about what I said. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. Let's say that somebody's like, somebody comes up and they said, Hey, you know, when you said the coaches were idiots for blank and blank, and I, I would say this, I'd say, I said, coaches are idiots. And he's like, well, you implied. And I'm like, okay. So, all right. But I didn't say that. Yeah, but you implied. Okay. Right. But I didn't, I didn't say that. So yeah, I mean, that, that wasn't something that I said, but, but tell me what you're thinking. So the first piece, is I don't need to defend anything if the outcome didn't take place. Okay. Right. There's no, def I don't need to defend like that. I didn't say coaches are idiots, but he's like, you implied that, but here's the thing, right? I am. And if, by the way, if I did say coaches are idiots, I still don't need to defend because guess what? I said it. So I can't get defensive around something I did say. <laughs> yeah. That's my point. Like with people like getting defensive, I'm like, look, did you or didn't you? If you did, what are you defending? Like you did it, own it. The question is whether or not you're proud of it or not. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. 100%. So, so either way, I'm not going to get defensive. Like I can hear my wife, my kids out there. If my wife comes up and she's upset with me, right? There's two things. I'm either, I'm good on what I said or what I said was in fact not who I wanted to be. Either way, I don't need to be defensive. Like she's like, I don't like the way you said that. I'm like, well, what do you not like? Right. And it's, well, it was this. Okay. Well, I believe that. And I think that's what you needed to hear. And I stand by it. I, well, I don't like that. Okay. Right. I like, you, I, I hope, I hope you cycle through that. Well, like I, you're a mature adult. I think you cycle through that. Well, I love it. Right. Like, like, you no, know, my, my point is like, like with E plus R equals O and defensiveness, we did or we didn't. That's number one. You did it or you didn't. Okay. If I didn't do it, I don't need to be defensive. If I did do it, I for sure can't be defensive because I did it. And by the way, if I didn't do it, I don't need to defend. This is the piece. Uh, and we're not talking like murder trials here, right? But like if somebody's like, you did this, that, and it's like, I didn't. That's it. Like that, there's not. It ends but in you, the discussion right there. I just, I mean, I, I don't have to defend. And if I did do it, I guess I did do that. Then we move to the outcome. And here's where it gets a little harder for the outcome. Like out, the, the response portion, non-defensiveness is, is no problem. The outcome is, is harder because the objective outcome, we either stand by it or we don't, right? Like I made this decision and the outcome didn't work and it came from my choices, period. Okay, cool. I made this decision. It didn't work. Don't defend. Like the things you did had outcomes. Okay. Here's where it gets really hard. It's when we did something and it had a subjective impact on somebody that you don't like the way they interpreted it, but it had that impact on them. And here's the thing, coach, we are absolutely responsible for that. Even when we don't agree with their assessment, because where did that come from? What we said. And we, own so, that. so we can't like, if I say something to you right now and it mm -hmm. offends you, I can't get defensive because you got offended. I said it and it had the impact on you. There's not a debate there, Ron. There's no debate. You were offended by what I said. The question is whether or not I stand by what I said or not. And if, if, you I, do, stand by, like, if I stand by it, I'm like this, you know, 
That's I, I'm I'm bummed and I'm sorry that that offends you. I believe that. Maybe 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 I'm like oh, I could have phrased it differently, and I and I'll say that I'm like okay, you know what? I believe that, but you know what? I think the way I said that, like I don't know, I might have come across more brash, or I might have like tiptoed around the eggshells. I wasn't really clear, right? And so you kind of sensed uh, some peace. And again, again, I'll give you a, a true story from me. Two of them recently. The other day, I I, I wrote an email about um, privilege, and uh, in in my daily discipline email, I wrote a this was I don't know a month or a couple months ago. Wrote an email about privilege. And it, it said, essentially, it was, it was highlighting how people talk about privilege like it's a magic pill for success in life. Like people who have privilege have all this, you know, have all this great stuff. And people who lack privilege, like they're incapable of being successful. And that's, that's a very common thread and trend, okay? And I just wrote the email of saying, look, like here's, here's, here's what else is in this story. That people who have privilege are oftentimes weakened by their privilege because they get shielded from realities. Uh, they're weak and they don't know it until it's too late. And everybody puffs them up with stuff and then life hits them and they don't have a lot of muscles built. And then people who don't come from privilege, you see this happening all the time, is their lack of privilege was what created the inner greatness. It was what showed them the, how to fight and claw and scrap and appreciate everything. And so this blanket of privilege sets you up for life and lack of privilege destroys you for life. I'm like, that, that's not how it actually works. There's privilege that sets people up and there's lack of privilege that ruins people. And then there's the exact opposite happens out of those two things, right? Somebody emailed me back, a teacher, mad, right? Mad. How dare you? How tone deaf this is? I already believed this about you. I'm unsubscribing. And so I said, <clears throat> what did you think I was trying to say? What did you think was tone deaf? And what did you already believe about me? That's how I replied. I said, hey, I'm super bummed to have you unsubscribe. What did you think was tone deaf? Uh, uh, what did you think I was trying to say here? And what did you already believe about me? And she wrote me back an answer. And in her answer, she called me a bigot. She called me sexist. She called me uh, uh, completely tone deaf and ignorant and uh, and something else. She called me uh, uh, a strategic choice of words trying to jump on a white privilege train. I don't know, some, something, something, right? Just came at me, right? Lord. And invented, and invented, by the way, in, in the answer, invented a bunch of things that I didn't say that were her interpretations and the story she was telling herself about the meaning of what I said. So there's two things that happened here. Number one, I was responsible for every single thing that I wrote. I used the word privilege. I said that privilege is, is an inhibitor and lack of privilege is oftentimes one of the sparks. I'm responsible for that. Do I believe that? Yes, I do. I don't defend it. I didn't defend it to her. I believe it. She doesn't. It's okay. We just believe different things. She chose to judge me for it and, and invent things in her mind about what that makes me. I, I didn't. Okay. Then she called me a bunch of other things, whatever in there. And I said, but here's the thing. I am absolutely responsible for my impact on that young woman. Even though she misinterpreted, even though I think she comes from, in my point of view, a crazy worldview for what I said, right? I am responsible. I did have that impact on her. There is no debate on that. I absolutely had that impact. So I have to own, I made her feel that because of what I said. But the difference is I, I'm okay with that. It's not how I want to make people feel, but I believe more in my principles than protecting other people's emotions who want to misinterpret me. I'm there. I'm not going to get defensive. Another lady came up to me, uh, short one, another lady came up to me after a keynote in the school. I said the phrase pissed off one time. In a keynote, I said something, and she came up, and she was so mad. She, I mean, she chat like in person. She chastised me up and down for it. And I said, "Thank you for sharing your perspective. I hope you have a great day." Sure, that made her even more angry. You know, I'm just like, like, I don't care about the phrase "pissed off" or any word for that matter. I don't personally. She doesn't share that with me. Like, I'm not going to defend my right to say that. I don't. What am I like? I made her mad. Okay. I just accept that because I, I either need to change or I need to accept that my behavior has an impact on some people that is adverse sometimes. Does that make sense? It does 100%. So it's, it's, it's own the response because where people get defensive is they get defensive about what they did or didn't do. And then they get defensive about the impact of what they did or didn't do. So the first thing we have to do is just be honest. Did we, or didn't we? And then number two is we have to look at the impact. And if the impact existed, 
you are responsible for it. It doesn't matter if it was the if it was the wrong interpretation. You're responsible. Don't defend. Own whether or not that was where you want to go, whether that was your best, whether that was discipline, whether you got to refine. You know, you, you got to we got to own that whole piece. Yeah, I, I freaking love that, and so does uh, Coach Lowry. Outstanding knowledge dropped. Thanks. Love it. And and by the way, by the way, interesting note on that, right? I did not try to get that person to come back and stay as a subscriber. I didn't try to convince them of anything. Just like that was the impact. They left. They don't read my stuff anymore. Gotcha. It, you, you owned it. And coaches, if you want to, coach as uh, Brian has did something that I think you would freaking love. It's also in the in the comments right there. Uh, this, this worksheet. What is this worksheet? To let the coaches know what this worksheet is. Yeah, it's the it's a uh, the E plus R equals O do the worksheet. So what my, my team and I came back together and and we started I started writing my daily discipline email three years ago because I'd get done with something like this or a, a workshop or a keynote someone doing in person with and and they'd say you know how do I keep this alive right and I said well you know finally I got they, they didn't like the answer and I said you do it like how do you keep yourself alive you know you wake up and you you do whatever you need to do to keep yourself alive right. So um, um, I'm writing notes to myself every day, right? Like I've got notes, you know, I mean, literally you can see like, like right here, leading teams, right? This is my notebook, right? From the end of last year. Um, and I've got 15 more, look, literally on my desk, right? Like these are my notepads, right? Like they're literally just all over. Right? So I've got all these. I'm like, okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. Rather than me writing these notes just to myself, I'm going to start sharing what I'm writing down with you guys. Because how I keep it alive every day is I study, I train, I practice, I write, I think, I execute, I see what my results are, I double down, triple down, invest, or change and adjust and alter. That's what I do. So I started writing the email. Um, we launched the podcast this year, and every one of them ends with do the work, right? Because consuming the info is 5% of, of life. And that's what there's a lot of consumption going on right now. This is consumption. It's a, it's a necessary part. I got a lot of books back here. I'd love to read them all. Uh, but that's consumption. Doing the work is where we get better. Yep. And so I ended up do the work, do the work. This worksheet is a transition between the end of the email, the end of the podcast, the end of this video. It's the bridge to implement into your life. And what the worksheet is, it's a single page. It uses E plus R equals O. And it, it has three categories, three, three areas to write applications of what is frankly anywhere, but like I obviously we use it for ours. Whatever that message is in the podcast that day or in the email that day, how do you convert the principle into your life? And using E plus R equals O. I give you three categories. One is performance, one is relationships, and one is your mental and physical health. And you use E plus R equals O to identify, all right, based on what I just learned, what outcomes do I think would happen in my life if I did that better? And write down, this is what it'll deliver to me, okay? Then go over to the event and say, all right, what's the context where I need to be applying this skill? So take something like, uh, um, um, I don't know, focus, right? Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about, we're doing some super skills in the podcast, focus. Say, all right, well, what, what outcomes would, would benefit from focus? What would be created in my life through focus? Well, I would get more done in less time. I would spend less time on, on stuff that didn't matter and I could spend more time with my family, okay? That's it. Okay, where's the context where I need to bring focus? In the first two hours of my day, um, you know, in in the mornings and weekends when my family sleeps in, again, you write down some context and you say, okay, cool. What skills and areas of my behavior do I need to bring focus to? So what happens is that the worksheet helps us convert from an email I wrote to now you doing work to implement the skill that I was writing or talking about into the real moments of your life to pursue the real important priorities that you're serving so that you didn't just read a good email, you know, maybe retweet it and be like, that was really cool. Like that doesn't make me happy. What makes me happy is you say, hey, I did this and it was hard and I kept doing it and it was even harder and then I kept doing it and then I started getting good and then it was kind of sloppy and then like now look what happened three months later. Dang, I just did this. That's what makes me happy. I like somebody saying they like to read my email. I'm like, eh. Are you going to do something with it? Like, I love you and I really appreciate the support, but like, 
I would much rather you just don't tell me you like the email and you just told me what it produced in your life. That's what you produced in your life through it. That's what I want. So this worksheet is totally free. Uh, you know, most of you who know me uh, know E plus R equals O is the way I look at everything in life. And uh, and so this is just that bridge between the end of the content and like, all right, how do I get it into my life? And a lot of people use it with their athletes. So they'll, they'll take the sheet down and it's how they convert principles for their athletes as well. They give them all the sheet, they put it down, they do it together. They do it once or twice, uh, you know, once a day, a couple times a week, something like that. I love it. And coaches, again, you need to get this resource. So it's in the and you get the you get the you get the five finger discount, by the way. It is absolutely free. That's con right there. To get to do the work to get your program better and to get results. And you're absolutely right. Doing the work. Why do you think before we go, because my wife just came here, uh, why do you think it's hard? Oh, <laughs> why do you think it's hard to actually do the work? Like we just consume and don't put that into practice. And what's one tip? Besides, you know, do the work that we can motivate because you're huge on discipline. I love that about yep. you as well. How can we yep. get a little bit more discipline every single day? So why do people not do the work? Um, I, you know, I think in today's and one, one is I'm a, I read, I read books. Uh, uh, I don't read new books. I only read old books. So, so, and I mean this for real, like I, I have a pretty hard rule unless it's technical um, I only read books that are a hundred years old or more. I like that. Like I, I don't read new books and it's not like, it's not, I did like, a, I did like almost a two years where I, where I, where I was hard, hard line, like absolutely, uh, no exceptions other than technical, right? Like, you know, reading, you know, reading about how to install an offense or something like that. Right. But if it was a principle based book, uh, nothing that was written in the last hundred years for this reason, I want reliable truths, not new best-selling truths. Books today are written to sell. Yes, they are. Books that have been in print for 4,000 years, 1,000 years, those books are full of value that has carried 1,000 years or more. That means it's value that has transcended all of our global changes and the principles still hold true that we got to get in front of people. That's what I want to build my life, my business, my relationships on. Right. So that's number one is if you look at old work, people have struggled with the work forever. Okay. It's also, it's also part of how we were wired, right? We're, we're wired to pursue comfort and avoid that because we're wired for survival. Okay. And so here's the thing. Um, our life has changed now. Because uh, now we can afford to be comfortable all the time and we don't die. Yeah. And that's, and, that, and Ron, that's, that's new as in like the last hundred years only yeah. of human history. And you think about it. If you lost your tribe, if you lost your circle of people in 1855, which is what? 150 years ago ish, 170. Let's go back 1890 right? Which is 130 years ago. Doesn't feel like that long ago, but like 1900 turn of the century. If you lost your circle, you died. Yeah. You're done. You were, it was over. Even if you lived in a city, you needed a group to be okay. Now you only need a Netflix account and a DoorDash. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like we are not wired for this world. So we have to put things into play. So the reason I believe in doing the work is this. It's not about grinding. Like, I just, I, I'm fine if the word grind gets out of, you know, if, you're, if your plan for success is out grind everybody, you know, I don't know, good luck, I guess. But you just heard Saban on that thing the other day, right? He's like, we're not grinding people anymore. I don't know if he said it, but he's like, look, he's, I looked, he goes, we're going to outscore everybody. We had the number one SEC defense in the SEC and we were six points above what we think is average at 19 points. We think 13 points a game is average. And it changed because he's like, look, you're not going to grind people to win any football games anymore. Like you've got to go out and you got to do work to perform. So what I appreciate about that is nothing is going to happen without that work to get in it. And I, I equate it like this. And this is, the, this is the analogy I'll give. It's the weight room. Okay. It's the weight room. <clears throat> Being a great squatter and pouring yourself into the weight room does not guarantee you become all conference. But if you don't spill it in there, it ain't going to happen. Or you might luck into it. Or you may have enough talent. But look, if you want to bet on your talent without working, 
I believe in the freedom of you to make that decision. And for all of you out there, like if, if, if you think you don't have to work at ego and you don't have to work at empathy and you don't have to work at getting the self-interest of people aligned and you don't have to work at culture and you just want to bet on your talent, by all means, feel free to make that bet. Let's check in in five or 10 years. Go bet your life on it. I know where I'm putting my cards. I'm not putting my cards in the guy who can get away without doing the work necessary to do it. I'm just not banking on that. I'm not banking that in my marriage. I'm not banking on that as a dad. I'm not banking that in myself. You know, I'm probably going to go down and deadlift after this. Like just, this is what it takes, right? So the weight room is the, is, is my perfect place of like the weight room guarantees nothing. And the weight room doesn't, doesn't respect anything but effort. Yeah. It doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't care about your background. It doesn't care about anything. You work in there. It works, period. Now, bar- how good you are is a very different piece, but it works. Same thing with these principles here. Leadership, culture, discipline, focus, effort, empathy. They work. But you have to supply all that effort and then put yourself in a position to go be good. So that's number one. Number two is you asked, what, what, was, what was the second question you were saying? Uh, um, um, you were saying, how do, we, how do we convert? How do we, yeah. how do we bring something out? What's the one, number one thing? It, here's what I'll tell you is this. Your programs compete not just based on the product of what comes out of them, but your programs compete on what creates that product. So, you know, the product of what comes out of them is how hard your players play. The, 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 the product that comes out is, you know, the, 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 uh, the level of execution of your schemes and the, 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 the quality of your schemes that come out, no doubt, right? Um, the talent that is in there, all of that. Like that, that's all the end product, okay? But you're not just competing of what's on the football field. You're competing on what creates all of that. So you compete as a program as much on the quality of your culture, the quality of your leadership, the quality of uh, the decisions of your athletes and their personal discipline, as much as you compete, you know, based on, you know, the way you coach three technique, cover two, mesh, RPOs, you, you compete on all the rest of it. And the cause and effect is important to understand. The quality of your leadership, the quality of your culture, the quality of the behavior of everybody in your program, it is the determinant of whether everything else in your program goes like this is average or goes like that. And so I would love to see coaches and more coaches committing to teach leadership, culture, and behavior with the same technical depth and thoroughness and energy that they teach the other things in their program. Because those things are way harder to teach and learn than, than, you know, your mesh schemes. Yeah. Your mesh schemes, your mesh schemes are relatively simple comparatively, right? And I, you know, they're already simple, right? Like they're just, they work, right? But, but, you know, we have to figure out where we're competing. And, and if you want proof, let's, let's just look at the college football world. We could look at other sports, but just, just look at college football. And here's what you're going to find. The teams that have been winning for the last decade, what's the only thing they have in common? Uh, in every conference, the teams that, that are at the top, Decade after decade or, or, or year after year after year of the last 10, 15 years. What's the one thing they all have in common? They have, uh, to me personally, it's like they have a, a identity or a culture that they all believe in. There you go. The best teams in college football have phenomenal cultures. Mm-hmm. Their talent varies. Their superstars vary. Now, what you have when you marry amazing culture with incredible talent is you end up with Alabama, Ohio State. Clemson, you end up with like, you know, the dogs of the dogs, right? But you look at, you look at the teams that have been winning, you know, the Boise State when, you know, with Harson there and with Coach Pete there. And I work with both of those guys, right? Great culture, not top end talent, winning year after year after year after year after year. Nick Saban scheme all over the place over the course of the last 10, 15 years, right? High performance offense, low performance offense, game managers behind center, you know, guys going out and spreading it like, like superstar defenses spread the scheme. Eh. like the best schemers you don't see them winning championships year after year after year you You just don't flash in the pans you just don't what you see is the best cultures find themselves attracting the best people the best talent the best schemers the and that's why so that's the big piece that just would, would, would just open your eyes and look the commonality between, and by the way, look at other sports if you want, because it's the same thing. 
the second they have the culture working and they can hold it and keep it and stay there, that team performs at a high level for a very long time. The teams that are winning on talent are doing this. And it's really hard when you go down to get it back up. They don't come back up very often. Look at Texas football. <laughs> you know, like, like you know, hook them. Like, you know, uh, that program should be winning a lot more than it is, but the culture fell yeah. and they couldn't get it back. And it's hard. And that's a program that should never be where they are. No way. You're right. But you know, and they're working really hard to come back and do it, you know, in good form. But anyway, that's, that's the commonality. So that's what I would just tell everybody is, is don't undervalue scheme by any stretch of the imagination. It's just understand what makes, what makes that perform it the way it performs. It's culture. All right. Now, before we go, I have to, I've never heard of the 100 year book rule. I freaking love that. Mm. I'm a, I'm an avid reader. What book do you think yeah. I should, should like, you're like, you need to read this. Hold on. All right. I'll give you two. Heck yeah. I'll give you two. So that this number one, this is uh, one of my favorites. It's called Roots of Strategy. You can get it on Amazon. It's on uh, Kindle as well. It's called Roots of Strategy. It's the five greatest military classics of all time. Oh, I like that. And I, and I like the military side because this is Sun Tzu, Vigetius, de Sachs, Frederick, and Napoleon, right? So it's not it's not uh, um, uh, glamorizing war, uh, it, but it's the principles. And here's the cool part: this book is 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 maybe twenty percent. Uh, 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 strategy and it's 80% about how to lead men. So here's the greatest people with their life on the line. And there's a piece in here, right? Where, where, and I won't read it, but there's a piece in here, De Sachs, a, a French general from 500 years ago or so. And he said, the defining trait of generals is the ability to uh, uh, move the hearts of men because there's nothing so variable day to day. A sergeant can line up our troops, but only a general can move their hearts. And it is the defining trait of a leader. And I'm like, okay, well, that was 500 years ago in French army. I wouldn't want to be in that culture. <laughs> you know, like that wasn't soft. Yeah. And he was saying, you got to move the heart. And then, so that's number one. The second one is my favorite. It's called the Enchiridion. Uh, and they say it's by Epictetus, but it's not. It's actually by uh, a general named Arian. A, uh, a R R I A N, um, who was a student of Epictetus, and he compiled his teachings. And what Enchiridion means in uh, in Latin is it means uh, the manual. It's a manual for life. It's a Stoic. Uh, those are the two. Heck yeah, man. This one's this is the thinner one, by the way. If if if, if, you, if, you, if you're looking for what to do on a weekend, this one might be the one to go to because you know this one's beefy. <laughs> Well, Brian, man, I appreciate it, dude. I, th this was amazing. I'm I'm about to listen to this again. It's been a blast. I uh, I appreciate being on here, and hopefully, people got some value. Yes, sir. And coaches, thank y'all so much again. I cannot recommend this worksheet enough. And then also all of everything else that you have out there: your Twitter, your YouTube, Instagram, all of that is in the description below. I appreciate you being here, and coaches, I appreciate y'all being here as well. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Good to see everybody.